Hello, we're going to talk about post-processing related to cardiac CT. So here's our topic list. We're going to talk about calcium scoring. We're going to talk about doing coronary CTA. We're going to talk a little bit briefly about the interpretive and reporting process using a workstation. We'll briefly talk about some advanced workstation post-processing features. And finally, mention just briefly about storage of the image data sets on PACS. So let's move into calcium scoring. So basically what's going to happen is you're going to acquire images that are three millimeters thick with three millimeter increments. And that's basically left over from EBCT. That's the way EBCT was obtained. And we're going to load that axial data set. Then the software is going to highlight anything that has a Hounsfield units greater than 130 Hounsfield units. And then we're going to go and we're going to find these highlighted areas within each of the coronary vessels and label which vessel the highlighted calcium is in. One thing to be careful of is mitral annular calcification. Make sure you don't score mitral annular calcification as left circumflex coronary artery calcification. Here you can see an axial image with calcification in the LAD. We turn on the highlighting and you can see it'll highlight anything with a Hounsfield unit greater than 130. So it's highlighted the calcium within the vessel and then we'll go through the process of scoring it. So basically you click on it, the computer will highlight the area and it'll calculate the area. Anything that's contiguous with this, so in and out of the plane, superior and inferior or cranial or caudal to this, it'll also highlight. If there's too much disruption as you see here between this and this area, it's not gonna bridge that so you'd have to click here to score it. So you can see then as you score each one, it's going to add it. Here we've shown that this is in the LED. Here's the score based on the area. And that's an Agatston score. And as you keep adding and as you add different vessels, you get a total score. One of the things I want to make sure is that when you do calcium scoring, you not only give just the raw score, but you actually do a population distribution. So depending on if the patient's male or female and what age they are, the calcium scoring will affect where they fit within the patient population. The scoring system that we generally use for scoring distribution is the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis or the MESA study. It's an NIH study. It's about 6,000 men and women from six communities in the U.S. You can see the six universities that were involved here. And so when you plug the data in, you can go to their website. You can plug in the patient's age what the gender is, what their race slash ethnicity is, and their calcium score, and you'll get a population distribution. And you can see for a 56-year-old white male, approximately 45% of the population won't even have any calcium, and then it goes up from there. And to get to the 90th percentile, you can see here you needed a score of about 267. So this patient who has a score of 24 is at the 59th percentile. Coronary CTA data sets, what are you going to create? Well, in general, you're going to have one to three phases, especially depending if you do prospective versus retrospective data sets. And then if you do do retrospective, you also may have functional data sets. In general, we create 10 phases. With post-processing, curved MPRs, MIPS, and volume rendered images may be created. In general, those are performed by the technologist on a workstation, and they're sent back to packs and stored. Remember, at least in the United States, if you want to bill for a CTA, regardless of what body part it is, you have to do some 3D post-processing and store those on packs and indicate that in your report. In general, the coronary data sets are going to be 0 0.6 to 0 0.9 millimeters thick. And for best image quality, you want about a 50% overlap. So if you have a 0 0.6 millimeter thick slice, your increment's going to be 0.3. If you're at 0 0.9, your increment's really going to be 0 0.45. You're generally going to create mid to late diastolic images, 60 to 80% of the R to R interval, depending on which scanner you're on. So in general, it's going to be 60, 65, or 70%, 70 or 70, 75, or 80%, depending on your vendor. The main difference here is that Siemens defines the percent of the R to R interval at the beginning of the window. So in general, at a heart rate of around 60, it's about 10% less than on Philips or GE, for example. And then you're going to have a relatively smooth reconstruction kernel. 
Here's just a native coronary artery data set just to give you an idea of what the images are going to look like. Again, relatively thin images with about a 50% overlap in the increment. And then you're going to want to have a relatively smooth kernel. Here's a cabbage data set. The one thing you'll notice here is, is that we're starting higher. One thing that you want to make sure you do on a cabbage, especially if you don't know if they have an internal mammary bypass graft or not, this patient does have an internal mammary bypass graft. So you want to start relatively high so you can see the origin of that left internal mammary artery from the subclavian. Some people argue there can't be stenosis at the inflow. I'll tell you that I've seen cases where there is stenosis in the proximal left internal mammary artery at the origin from the left subclavian. So you want to make sure you follow it all the way down. In general, you're not going to know for sure whether the patient has a lima graft or not. So we always start above the level of the origin of the lima and scan all the way down through the heart. If you're dealing with stents, the reconstruction technique is slightly different. You're going to want to make sure that you use the absolute thinnest images, so 0.6 to 0.67, depending on your vendor. Again, a 50% overlap. You really only need the best phase, so you've already evaluated and picked out what your best phase is. And then the big thing is, is you want to use a sharp kernel. You really want edge enhancement for better visualization of the stent. So very sharp kernels. So this means you're going to have a little bit more noise within your image data set. Here you can see a coronary stent data set. And you'll notice that we have two stents, one in the LAD and one in the circumflex here. And you'll notice we've used very, very thin images. And, and the images are a little more noisy. That's because we've used a sharp kernel. But that really allows you to better visualize the stents. Again, the overall image quality when you've got stents in place are going to depend on what the stent material is and that affects how well the radiation interacts with the stent and therefore how much artifact you get, how much density there is when you're evaluating stents. The functional data set, again this is only going to be if you're doing retrospective acquisition. Generally we create 10 phases throughout the cardiac cycle you want them about every 10%, so you can go 0 to 90% every 10, so 0, 10, 20, etc. Or you can even do 5 to 95. I actually have done 5 to 95 traditionally because I found that around 35%, if you need to go to that in systole or if you're calculating an actual function where you want true in systole, that 35% tends to be more the in systolic phase of the heart rather than 30 or 40%. In general, because we're only looking for function and wall motion here, we can use thicker images. If you think about MRI, we generally have 8 millimeter thick images that we've put together to form the overall volume of the left ventricle. So in general, when I do these, I make them about 1.5 millimeters thick, and also you don't need any overlap. So you can do 1.5 at 1.5 millimeters thick. In general, a functional data set will be about 100 images rather than the 300 plus that you're going to get with your thinner coronary data set. Interpretation. In general, we're always going to use the workstation to do interactive evaluation and interpretation. Basically, the way I read all of my patients, even to this day, is using the three-plane MPR interactive and manipulating those. Mostly, I use MPRs, especially if you're looking more at the anatomy. Thin MIPS can also be used. You can also perform interactive evaluation of your functional data set. What you're looking for is qualitative assessment, looking for overall global and regional wall motion, as well as doing a quantitative assessment, which the software will help you with as well. And then you can also look at valves. In particular, we look at the mitral valve to make sure that there's no prolapse, and we look at the aortic valve looking for regurge. Um, if there's at least moderate regurge, you can see it and also looking for aortic valve stenosis. There's at least one study that was published in radiology in 2007 looking at what is the best way, the most accurate way to interpret these studies. And you'll notice that the most accurate way, the best way that they came up with was interactive MPR versus pre-rendered images by your technologist. So here's your axial data set again. We've already talked about this. So I start off by looking through the axial data set and with most of the patients I'm doing now, with the appropriate indication, the appropriate patients, which we've already talked about in our pitfalls lecture, 
I'm able to do 80 to 90% of my read just from the axial coronary data set. However, I do generally do some further interrogation with interactive MPR. So here we can start with the right coronary artery. I generally always start with the right coronary artery. The reason for that is, is it tends to be the one that has the most problem with motion artifacts. So I know that when I'm evaluating the right coronary artery, if I'm happy with the image quality, it's going to be fine to evaluate the left coronary arterial system. You can see here we're lining up with the coronary artery on the axial image in the bottom left. And then we're going to scroll down and we're going to line up with it on the image on the top left. We're going to angle the green line to show it. And what we're trying to do here, as you can see in the top right image, is we're trying to lay out and make a nice what we call C view of the right coronary artery. So we're going to add a little bit of thickness here, make this a thin MIP. And then you can see very nicely in this patient, it's very nice. It's not a very tortuous right coronary artery. So even in one image, we can see a very nice C view of the right coronary artery. Moving on to the left main, even in patients where I really don't think there's any disease, this is the one vessel that I usually always will lay out. The angle is usually a little bit unusual to evaluate it on the axial images. I feel like I don't always get a good assessment of the left main on axial images. So I usually always take the time to lay this out. You can see again, we're laying it out with two longitudinal views and then our top image in the top left is gonna have our cross-sectional view. Then we move on to the LAD. Again, in the bottom left, we're gonna lay it out. We're gonna lay out along the long axis of it. And then we're gonna lay out along the long axis of it on the top right. And then we're gonna get our short axis view in the top left. Now what you'll notice is, is that we've gone to thin MIPS in the top right and in the bottom left images, but the top left image, which is the cross-sectional view, we've left as a thin MPR, an MPR without any thickness to it. And I would advise you to make sure that when you're evaluating the vessels on the cross-sectional view that you do not use any thickness. Don't make them as a thick MIP. The reason for that is, is you could miss a very short segment coronary artery stenosis. The other thing is, is you want to be careful on evaluating stenosis with thin MIPS. If there is a significant stenosis on a thin MIP, you're fine. However, however, you can underestimate a stenosis using thin MIPS. If you remember, the plaques are generally always eccentric, so your thin MIPS are only going to show you the bright contrast. If you've got a non-calcified plaque, you can very easily miss this with thin MIPS because it's going to be overshadowed by the dense contrast within the vessel. So be careful with thin MIPS. You can actually underestimate a stenosis. Now moving on to functional, we're going to lay this out. We're going to lay out along the long axis here of the ventricle on the axial image. We've got a two chamber in the top left, which we're going to lay out along the long axis there. That gives us our short axis image. And using our short axis image, we're going to angle just slightly down. And that's going to give us our true four chamber image in the bottom left. Then we can actually play that. We can move up and down, especially looking at the short axis view in the top right. And we're going to be able to look at our regional and wall motion overall. We also have in the bottom right an overall ventriculogram. So again, just looking at the ventricular gram, again, remember that's just going to be lumen, not actually looking at the wall. But you can see if there's overall good global function and if there's some regional wall motion abnormalities. Here we have two movies showing the aortic valve. On the left, we have a calcified aortic valve. You can see that the valve is not opening very well. And that is consistent with aortic stenosis. We can actually scroll up and down until we find the area where it's the tightest as far as the opening. And we can actually measure that. And by planimetry, we can categorize this aortic valve as being mild, moderate, or severe in stenosis. The image on your right, you can see we've scrolled up and down the leaflets. You can see there's a little hole right in the middle. These leaflets never actually touch. And therefore, this is consistent with a case of regurgitation. Here we're going to demonstrate making a curved NPR. In general, this is something that your techs are going to do for you.
but it never hurts for you to know how to do this. So basically what we're doing is we're just following the right coronary artery down. We're clicking and following it on our axial images. And once we get to the bottom, we're going to actually have an MPR. And you can make multiple parallel MPRs as well so that you have a stack of MPRs to look at and evaluate. Again, you need to make sure, at least in the United States, that you do reconstruct MPRs and store them on packs in order to get paid for a CTA exam, regardless of what body part it is. But it also can help you evaluate, and also it's good for using to communicate with your referring physicians to demonstrate where a stenosis is. Now let's move on to reporting. So there's a couple things I want to talk about when I talk about reporting. One is whenever you find a lesion, you want to talk about what the plaque characteristics are, whether they're calcified, non-calcified, or mixed. You'll find that the majority of plaques are mixed or even purely calcified. The purely non-calcified plaques are relatively few and far between. However, as a new learner, these are some of the ones that you're going to most easily miss. And I've seen lots of participants in different courses totally miss a significant stenosis due to a purely non-calcified plaque. So pay very close attention to evaluating for non-calcified plaque. In general, we're not good enough to separate out in the non-calcified category. The small areas that are truly lipid rich from the fibrous, we can overall do some categorization of plaques as a whole, but to really break down within the plaque, spatial resolution of CT is really just not there. And then we talk about the effect on the lumen. The three main categories I want you to know are mild luminal narrowing, moderate luminal narrowing, and significant stenosis. In addition to that, sometimes we add minimal luminal narrowing or we even add positive remodeling. Positive remodeling is basically the start of plaque deposition and generally it starts in the wall and it actually pushes the wall out without having any real effect on the lumen. So this is one big advantage that cardiac CT has over coronary angiography. We can see this buildup of plaque within the wall before it has any effect on the lumen, which at coronary angiography, remember we're looking really at a luminogram. So until there's some effect on the lumen in general, you're not gonna be able to see the plaque. Just a couple examples here. Here's a mixed plaque. You can see that there's calcified plaque and there's some area of decreased attenuation adjacent to that and that's a mixed plaque in the distal left main extending into the proximal LAD. And this is at least a moderate, if not a significant stenosis. We'd really have to lay it out and look at it further. Here's positive remodeling. You can see that there's calcified plaque and there really is no effect on the lumen. Again, remember with calcified plaque, it blooms, so it always looks bigger than what it is. And so if there really doesn't appear like there's any effect on the lumen, with a calcified plaque, in reality, it's going to be much smaller and have no effect on the lumen. Here's a significant stenosis, again, mixed plaque. You can see that regardless of where we look, there's no opacified lumen getting through this area, so this is a significant stenosis. And here's a case with two findings. You can see that there's been a mitral valve replacement. This is a stented bioprosthetic valve. And then we've got a myocardial bridge. So generally, the coronary arteries run in the epicardial fat, which you can see here. It's surrounded by fat, and then it dips down here. You can see it's surrounded by muscle, so this is a myocardial bridge. In the majority of patients, this is insignificant, but rarely in a few percentage of patients, it can cause some ischemia. Volume rendered images. The one area where I really find volume rendered images valuable is in coronary artery bypass graft cases and that's because it allows me to easily get a lay of the land. In this case, you can obviously see that there's a lemograph, there's lots of clips along the side branches, and then there's two aortic grafts, two coronary arteries. Sometimes it can be difficult, especially on the 3Ds, you're not really gonna be able to tell whether these are saphenous vein grafts or whether these are radial artery grafts. But it very nicely gives you a lay of the land showing you how many grafts you have, and it'll even show you sometimes if you've got an occluded graft. So here you can see there's a couple graphs. There's a graft here, a graft here, and then you'll see that there's this nubbin of this occluded graft. So again, it's very good to get an overview of coronary artery bypass grafts, but really it, otherwise it's of no value and you should not use it to look for stenoses. Pulmonary veins is another area where you can use the volume rendered images. 
Here's just a couple examples. This is the one case where left is left and right is right because we're looking posteriorly at the left atrium. So this just shows on the right that there's a superior, middle, and inferior. And here on the left that there's a common trunk coming in on the left. What we generally do with these pulmonary vein cases is we put a center line down the pulmonary vein. The computer then generates these axial images along that. You can see one of those axial images down here in the bottom right. And then what we do is we scroll along until we're right at the ostium, right before it enters the left atrium, and we get a bidimensional measurement. This bidimensional measurement is really for our own gratitude. And so if the patient comes back, if they have failed procedure and they need to have it again, or if they have symptoms and we want to look for pulmonary vein stenosis. In general, the cardiologists don't need this specific measurement. What they're looking for is just knowing what the overall anatomy is. Functional imaging. We've already kind of talked about this a little bit about doing a qualitative assessment. Now we can also do a quantitative assessment. It's very similar to doing an MR. We can draw the endocardial border on both in systole and in diastole, and that gives us our functional assessment. If we draw the epicardial border as well, we can actually find out what the myocardial mass is. We don't need all the 10 phases that you just saw previously. All we really need is just the in diastolic and in systolic images in order to do that assessment. And the software has gotten very nice. The other thing is, is that most of the software now has gotten to the point where it's truly a volume. So it actually segments out the volume within the cavity and segments out the myocardium. So rather than doing these circles on multiple slices like we do in MR, it's tr a true volume assessment. And you can see this patient, we get a full curve if we have all 10 phases. And we can say what the ejection fraction, in systolic, in diastolic volume, stroke volumes, all of that, as well as the myocardial mass. Now, let's talk a little bit about some additional advanced workstation features. The very nice thing is the software has gotten very good. This is an automatic segmentation, so we can go through and it can segment out the left atrium, the right atrium, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the aorta, the coronaries. You can see that in most cases it actually gives us very good images. And here's just a blown up 3D of that showing you the very nice segmentation. Obviously, this is just the lumens, so the myocardium has been taken away, and these are just the residual contrast opacified lumens. You can see very nicely here the right atrial appendage and how high up it comes along the aorta, which most people don't realize. The coronaries then, they were already segmented before. You can highlight over them, label them, so you can say that it's the right coronary artery, for example, in this case. You get the volume rendered image as well as the MPR image. So the segmentation and performance and creation of MPRs has gotten easier since what I showed you before. What I showed you before, the manual process will always work regardless of the disease that's there if the vessel is occluded. But the techs nowadays most of the time are using these automated tools and they'll just do some cleanup or correction if the center line gets off just a little bit. <laughs> this image on your left will be able, you'll be able to rotate this around and looking at it from different projections. And then you can actually get this filleted view or vessel view where it lays out and it gives you these nice little cross sections. So once you have this filleted out vessel view, they even have some more advanced tools. You can actually apply an IVIS view. So this is a virtual IVIS view that you can look at. And then you can scroll along. You have to scroll along the vessel here to be able to look at the entire vessel. Again, your cross sections are up above. And then you can actually rotate the vessel too because you, remember this is looking at it from a center line. If the vessel has disease, that center line may not be the true center line of the vessel. It's going to follow and be in the center of the opacified lumen. But if you've got eccentric plaque, you're going to need to rotate it around so you can see what the effect of that plaque is on the stenosis. The one thing I don't necessarily like about these is sometimes it, you can get lost as to where you are in the vessel, whether you're at the proximal, mid, or distal because it, not in every projection as you rotate it around are you going to see the branch vessels coming off. And when you do see the branch vessel coming off, sometimes it can be hard to determine, especially like in the LAD, for example, whether it's a diagonal or a septal perforator. You can also look at the vessel and characterize the plaque to some extent. It puts uh, boundaries on there so you can look for stenosis. This is one with, that's nice and clean. Here's one with a plaque. You can see the effect on the lumen. It'll actually calculate what the effect is on the lumen. 
and it'll even characterize it. So you can see that this is a calcified plaque having an effect on the lumen. And so when you lay this out, you can see what the effect is on the lumen and it'll actually give you numbers to determine what the effect is on the lumen. Pack storage. So in general, what do I send to pack? Well, you always want to send your best coronary data set. So if you've reconstructed three or four data sets, you're always going to want to pick the best and send that. That's generally three to 400 images, depending on what your slice thickness is and your increment. Then if you've done retrospective and you've got functional data, you want to store that. Again, as I told you earlier, it's about 100 images per phase, and you've got 10 phases. So that's around 1,000 images. You're going to have curved NPRs for the coronaries. You're probably going to have around five images, maybe more, per coronary vessel. So you're talking 20 or 30 images there. And then generally, we always do make at least a volume rendered of the whole heart to just get an overload view. So you're going to have maybe 20 images there. So all in all, you're talking maybe 1,500 images that you're going to send to PAX and store. So again, as a summary, we talked about calcium scoring, how you load it in and score that. Basically, that's really a see one, do one, teach one. Talked about the coronary CTA data sets that you're going to create. That's very important so that you can load them into the workstation and actually do your interactive interpretation using MPRs and then do your reporting, making sure you talk about what the plaque characterization is and the effect on the lumen. And then we talked about advanced workstation features. I have no problem with people using these advanced workstation features provided they learn how to do the interactive three-plane NPR first. The main thing with doing that is, is you know that that's always going to work regardless of what the severity of the disease is. If you've got a patient that really has significant disease, the automatic segmentation tools are probably going to fail. Make sure you can always fall back and do an interactive MPR three-plane evaluation. Otherwise, feel free to use the advanced tools, especially if you're doing quantitative functional evaluation. They work very well. And then you want to send your images to PACS for storage. Thank you very much for your attention.